All right, everyone, welcome. My name is Nathan Anderson. I'm the Dean of Clinical Education here at the Arizona School of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. Uh, a little background on me. Um, I began my career in California uh, in private practice and then started teaching at a variety of schools in the Los Angeles area starting in 2006. Uh, a couple years later, I had my first forays into academic administration as the uh, clinic dean at a couple of different campuses in Los Angeles, uh, and then moved to Tucson, my hometown, in 2013. Uh, joined the faculty here at the Arizona School of Acupuncture in 2015, uh, and have very much enjoyed working here, uh, teach both didactic classes um, and supervise some shifts in our school clinic. And then in January of this year, uh, I graciously uh, or, or enthusiastically uh, took on the position of uh, Dean of Clinical Education. So the topic that I'm gonna be presenting on today is uh, use of Chinese medicine for cold and flu prevention primarily. Uh, I will get into a little bit on cold and flu treatments, uh, in particular uh, herbal formulas that we use to treat colds and flus, uh, and a little bit of a discussion on COVID, but that is going to be a presentation topic uh, coming up soon in another lecture, so I don't want to step on the toes of that too much. I'll just, I'll just give a, a brief overview on, on how we approach COVID. Uh, before I get started, are there any questions from the group? Okay, um, if during the presentation, uh, there's any questions that do come up, you can either type them in the chat uh, and I'll have a chance to, to look at that periodically to answer those. Uh, but when I'm in a screen share, I don't always see the chats that come up. Um, and since the group size tonight isn't unwieldy too large, uh, feel free to go ahead and, and unmute yourself uh, and interject uh, if you have a question for me as we go along. So if uh, everybody's ready, I'll go ahead and go into a screen share and start the presentation. So cold and flu prevention and treatment with Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine has been around for at least 5,000 years and it's been used to treat billions of patients. Uh, the written record of Chinese medicine goes back at least 2,500 years and there's some um, pretty strong circumstantial evidence that Chinese medicine has been used for upwards of 5,000 years. Uh, and that is um, somewhat based on uh, preserved human remains that they found in a glacier uh, where there were tattoos on the acupuncture points and tattoos of the meridian system uh, on, the, on the persons that they found there in the glaciers. Uh, and they did carbon dating and uh, were able to, to date the, the bodies as uh, over 5,000 years old. Chinese medicine is a safe, comprehensive medical system, and it's comprised of many modalities. The best known here in the West is acupuncture, but also included under the umbrella of Chinese medicine would be electroacupuncture, herbal medicine, tuina, which is a Chinese orthopedic massage, nutrition therapy, exercise therapy, moxibustion, which is a focalized heat therapy uh, where we burn mugwort leaf uh, to create the heat, Cupping, which is a form of pneumatic suction. You can think of that as like a myofascial decompression. So lifting the tissues up rather than pressing them down with the massage. And then also gua sha or friction therapy uh, known in physical therapy circles as Graston therapy or scraping therapy. So we use a combination of all of these modalities, usually acupuncture and herbal medicine most frequently 
but drawing upon whatever we think is going to be of the most therapeutic benefit for our patients. Chinese medicine and Western science are describing the same phenomena, i.e. the human body and human physiology. We just use different terminology. And I, I liken the very well-known yin-yang symbol to Einstein's equation of E equals mc squared. So yang would be aspects of warmth, light, heat, movement, and then yin would be cool, substance, nutritive, and yin and yang are in balance, <clears throat> and <they're clears throat> this circle here indicates that they're constantly changing into one another. So here, the equal sign, E equals mc squared, this is not a static equilibrium. It's a dynamic equilibrium. Energy is constantly being converted into matter, and matter is constantly being converted into energy. And in my mind, our concept of qi in Chinese medicine is literally this equal sign. If things are spinning and moving harmoniously, this would be a large equal sign and we would have a lot of qi in the body. If it's a largely stagnant equation and yang and yin are not efficient, efficiently transforming into one another, then the equal sign becomes very small and, and we as humans would be then qi deficient. Um, not effectively performing all of our physiological functions. So there, there's often a, a, a hang up in terminology between Chinese medicine and biomedicine. And really we're just using different terms, different words, but we're all describing the same fundamental scientific phenomena. In Chinese medicine, <clears throat> illness arises when one or more pathogens disrupt the functions of the vital substances in our organ systems. So in Chinese medicine, we identify pathogens of cold, heat, and if that heat becomes severe, we call it fire or toxic heat. Wind, wind in Chinese medicine would be involuntary movements in the body, so spasms, tremors, tics, or lack of voluntary movement, paralysis, coma, hemiplegia, et cetera. Um, and then wind is also a pathogen that ar arises in early stage of illness. So early stage cold and flu have a wind component to them. And that's a, a different manifestation of wind. So it's not relating to involuntary movements or lack of voluntary movement. It's almost quite literally the, the cold draft uh, that you're exposed to that, uh, that the pathogens hit your ride on to invade the body. Another pathogen is dampness. We can think of that as unproductive fluid in the body. And that dampness, when it gets condensed, can turn into phlegm. And then we also have summer heat, which is very similar to heat, but just occurring in the summertime. And now these pathogens are going to interact or disturb the vital substances that we have in the body. And our vital substances are qi, blood, body fluids, yin and yang, as we discussed before, jing, which translates into essence, and it's similar to the biomedical concept of DNA, so literally the, the blueprint of who we are, and our shin, which is our mind or consciousness. And so different combinations of cold heat, wind, damp, summer heat will disturb, causing stagnation or deficiency in one of these substances here, and then that is when an illness arises. Focusing on the substance of qi, there are dozens of types of qi in Chinese medicine. Remember, it's that equal sign between yin and yang. And there are some types of qi that are more yin-like, more substance-like, very close to blood. So an example of that would be the ying qi or nutritive qi. Uh, and then we also have our wei qi, which is the protective or defensive qi. And that's analogous to our uh, innate immune system. Uh, so wei qi, its functions, it, it defends the body against pathogenic invasions. It, uh, it's literally the substance that, that fights off uh, the pathogens. 
It circulates in the superficial parts of the body in quote unquote, the space between the skin and muscles, which we would identify as the interstitium in, uh, in, in biomedical anatomy. Wei Qi is concentrated <clears throat> at mucous membranes, especially the nose and the throat, uh, i.e. those regions or vectors of infection for bacteria and viruses to invade the body. Wei Qi is closely related to lung Qi and many early stages of illness are gonna affect the lungs first. Um, in particular, colds and flus often have uh, lung symptomology associated with them. <clears throat> and then lastly, Wei Qi controls the opening and closing of our pores, i.e. it helps to regulate sweating in the body. And our Wei Qi, it's vulnerable to changes in weather or temperature. Exposure to wind, if our constitution is weakened due to poor sleep, nutrition, stress, lifestyle choices, i.e. various vices that we might consume or engage in. So the key to cold and flu prevention is the strengthening and health of our Wei Qi. So how do we strengthen and maintain healthy Wei Qi? The advice is gonna be very similar to what an MD would tell you. We need to get adequate sleep. Sleep is when the body undergoes tissue repair. Sleep, sleep is when the body uh, is, is in its restorative phase. And if we don't get enough sleep, we're not gonna be able to repair the damage that's being done to our bodies during the waking hours. We need to exercise. Exercise helps to build chi. Exercise helps to strengthen Wei Qi. Exercise helps to manage stress. And stress, in Western medicine, <clears throat> we recognize that stress can cause virtually any illness or exacerbate any existing illness. And it tends to attack us at our weak spots. So stress in Chinese medicine loosely equivalent uh, is equivalent to the idea of qi stagnation. Um, so if our qi is not moving, it's not circulating where it needs to, it's not nourishing what it needs to. So if we're all stressed out and not managing that stress, uh, our qi is not gonna be properly circulating. We also wanna eat for the season, not just eating healthy whole foods, but the temperature of the foods, the nature of the temperature of the foods is important. We wanna eat warming foods in the fall and winter and cooling foods in the spring and summer. And a little bit later on, uh, I'm gonna have a, uh, a list of foods that are appropriate for uh, fall and winter, the cooler weather, which tends to be the high point of uh, cold and flu season. We obviously wanna dress for the weather um, wearing warmer clothing, more layers when it's cool out, uh, and then lighter clothing, fewer layers when it's warm out. Uh, and in particular, in Chinese medicine, we wanna make sure that we keep our neck and shoulders warm and our head warm. Uh, those are our vulnerable areas uh, for pathogens to invade. Uh, and, and the Wei Qi in the neck and shoulder region in particular is, is vulnerable to cool drafts. So we wanna make sure that we, that we stay warm. Avoiding exposure to wind and drafts and avoiding exposure to sudden fluctuations in temperature. This actually comes into play quite a bit in summertime in Tucson. So we often see <clears throat> wind cold type presentations in the summer, which is typically unusual. That tends to be more of a, of a fall and winter problem. But if we are going from air conditioned vehicle to outside hot temperature into air conditioned home, maybe swimming in the pool to cool ourselves off and then coming in with wet hair and wet skin and turning on a fan, those fluctuations in temperature uh, can, can leave us vulnerable uh, to, to pathogenic invasions. Vices such as alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, uh, well-established there that those are uh, depleting for the immune system. And some non-Chinese medicine supplements, especially vitamin D, vitamin C, and zinc 
can definitely help the immune system. Uh, I want to provide a little commentary on vitamin D dosage. So most multivitamins will have maybe at most 800 IU of vitamin D, which is fine for <clears throat> maintenance of vitamin D for most folks, but if they're vitamin D deficient, that is probably not gonna be enough. So I generally recommend for my patients anywhere from 1,000 to 4,000 IU of vitamin D, <clears throat> and I prefer vitamin D3. Uh, that range tends to be safe for most people. Over 4,000 IU can be appropriate if somebody is significantly deficient, but it is possible to take too much vitamin D and make yourself sick. So unless um, there are routine labs being done to monitor the vitamin D3 levels, uh, I rarely recommend more than 4,000 IU a day. Uh, that's about the most that I'll go. And another supplement that I didn't put on the list here um, that is very good for the immune system is elderberry extract. And the reason I left it off is elderberry can be a little bit dangerous if you happen to catch COVID. So prior to exposure to COVID, elderberry is fine, um, immune boosting, fantastic supplement. But if you test positive for COVID, if you become symptomatic for COVID, elderberry has cytokines in it and it triggers a release of cytokines which can worsen the cytokine storm, which is one of the, the very dangerous symptoms of COVID, uh, the rapid onset of inflammation throughout the body. So if you are taking an elderberry extract for your immune system, but you do happen to catch COVID, <clears throat> it's very important that, that uh, one stop taking elderberry uh, once, once COVID has been uh, tested for positive. And then of course, Acupuncture and Chinese herbs uh, can help to strengthen the Wei Qi. And we'll get into some specific, specific formulas here in just a bit. Some good foods to eat in the wintertime. It's always a good idea to eat the fruits and vegetables that are in season. So things that are in season in the fall and winter, root vegetables, potatoes, carrots, squash, are very good. Winter greens, very good. Dark beans, uh, black beans, red beans, cabbage, mushrooms of all sorts, and then warming spices such as ginger and garlic. Onions are very good for cold weather food. And then eating more soups and stews, especially if you make a bone broth at home. And if you do want to make a, uh, a bone broth at home, I, I like uh, to do a chicken bone broth, uh, just putting the whole chicken carcass after eating a roast chicken into a pot. Cover it with water, bring it to a boil, and then, and then lower it to a low simmer, and let it cook for a minimum of 24 hours, but upwards of 36 to 48 hours, so that we can get that nice, slow extraction from the chicken bones. And uh, you know you've got a good bone broth if after you strain it and put it in the fridge, it turns slightly gelatinous. Uh, if your bone broth turns gelatinous, you have cooked it long enough. And then here is a recipe for a Chinese herbal chicken soup. Uh, we make this from time to time in the school dispensary here. Uh, herbal chicken soup, are a common traditional Chinese health food. Um, often make it with chicken or pork and vegetables. The soups are used to rebuild one's strength after an, in, after an illness, like in a convalescent stage. Uh, they're consumed prophylactically to counteract seasonal changes in the weather and to strengthen the immune system. So I have a list of the ingredients up here. Uh, the Chinese herb name, and then the common English name. So the herbal ingredients in this soup are lily bulb, snow ear mushroom, jujube fruit, angelica sinensis, cottonopsis root, goji berries, astragalus root, kelp, lotus seeds, long gone fruit, and Chinese yam. So the astragalus, cottonopsis, Chinese yam, jujube, 
These are all what we call chi tonics. They're used to boost our energy, build the immune system, and they help to aid in digestion. The angelica sinensis, longan fruit, and goji berries are blood tonics. We use them to nourish the liver and the heart and also help to build the immune system. The lily bulb and snow ear mushroom are what we call yin tonics. They're moistening, moistening fluids in the body, nourishing to the lung and the stomach. And Lianza, the lotus seed, nourishes the heart and the kidney, and it's very calming for the mind. It's a great stress-busting, mood-relaxing herb. So the recipe is we take a half chicken, teaspoon of salt, teaspoon of sesame oil, a teaspoon of wine, optional, our vegetables, a couple of ginger slices, and a tablespoon of soy sauce. Put the chicken in a medium-sized pot, cover it with water, we bring it to a boil, scoop off the fat that floats to the top, add in the herbs, ginger, salt, bring that to a slow boil, simmer for 45 minutes, add in the sliced vegetables, simmer till done, and then at the end, add in the sesame oil, soy sauce, wine, remove from the heat. This should make approximately four to six servings of soup. And uh, I will upload a PDF version of this uh, lecture at the end. Uh, so you don't have to scramble and write down the ingredients for this. You can, you can pull it off the PDF that I upload at the end. There are multiple herbal formulas to strengthen the Wei Qi. Um, the basic building block formula, the classical formula is Uping Feng San, or translated into English, Jade Windscreen Powder. The idea here being that we wanna prevent that pathogenic wind from being able to <clears throat> invade into the body. So these first two herbs, the astragalus root and Atractolotus rhizome, Huangqi and Baiju, those are both qi tonics. Huang Qi, in particular, a Wei Qi tonic. It guides the effects of the formula up to the interstitium, that space between the skin and the muscles, that outer layer of our body where the Wei Qi circulates. And Baiju helps the production of qi um, from our digestive tract, which ultimately is, is where all of our qi is being produced from the food and beverage that we consume. And then this last ingredient, silar root, feng feng, that herb helps to expel wind. And then it also assists the baiju in our digestive tract to be able to produce high quality qi. So many herbal vendors, practically all of them, will have their proprietary blend of uping feng san, where they will modify it with the addition of selected ingredients. And one of my favorite, and, and we do have it in our dispensary here at ASOM, it's called Immune Plus. So Immune Plus has all of the ingredients of Uping Feng San, but then it adds in cordyceps, reishi mushrooms, and shisandra berries. And these three ingredients all help to strengthen the lung. They all treat cough. Um, they help to transform phlegm. Cordyceps, uh, it's, it's well known as a, an endurance herb. So it, it kind of helps your, your physical endurance. Ling Jur, the reishi mushroom, in addition to helping the lung, it's a very good stress busting herb, a mind calming herb. It's uh, useful for, for insomnia. And Wu Wei Tzu also can help to calm the mind. And Wu Wei Tzu has a function of what we call astringing the lung chi, preventing that lung chi from, from leaking out. And Wu Wei Tzu also has a function of restraining sweating and closing the pores so that that wind cannot penetrate into the body. Now, it's entirely possible that based on, you know, despite our best efforts to strengthen our Wei Chi, everybody will catch a cold every now and then. And if we wanna treat that cold or flu, we have to determine from a, from a Chinese medicine perspective of whether it's a wind cold type presentation or what we call a wind heat presentation. 
So with the wind cold, which is going to be more common in the winter time, it tends to present with a low grade fever, usually less than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Chills will be a significant symptom, and the patient will probably report that they feel more chills than they do feel feverish. So though they may register a low grade fever on the thermometer, subjectively, they're gonna feel cold, wanna crawl under a blanket, wanna, wanna bundle up with extra layers. Body aches are very common with the wind cold, stiff neck and shoulders, runny nose with clear mucus, a mild cough, and there may or may not be a little bit of sweating if one catches a wind cold. Now, conversely, with the wind heat, we usually have a higher fever. Fever is usually gonna be above 101 Fahrenheit. Um, the patient will report feeling feverish more than feeling the chills. So if they have chills, the chills are gonna be mild, but they're gonna report feeling hot. Sore throat. Sore throat is an important determining factor here. And this is going to be a sore throat that comes on very early with the illness, not necessarily a post-nasal drip sore throat. So with a wind cold, if we have a runny nose with clear mucus, some of that mucus might be going down as a, as a post-nasal drip. And then three, four days later, because of that petri dish of mucus on the back of the throat, the patient develops a secondary sore throat. But it's not necessarily a sore throat that comes on day one, day two of illness. Um, with the wind heat, the cough tends to be more predominant uh, and the mucus is now gonna be yellow. We might see swollen tonsils. If we have a runny nose, the mucus is gonna be yellow colored to it instead of clear. Thirst will be a predominant symptom because of the heat. And we will usually see sweating as present with a, with a wind heat invasion. And we've got a variety of herbal formulas that can treat wind cold and wind heat. And of note, Chinese herbs can treat both bacterial and viral infections. There are plenty of antibiotics in Western pharmacology to treat bacterial infections, but there are very few options for viral infections. You know, there's, there's Tamiflu, um, but not much, not much beyond that for, for viral infections. So some common wind cold herbal formulas. One that's used very frequently is what we call gugentong or kudzu decoction. And we select this one when neck and shoulder pain is pronounced. If the most bothersome symptom is the stiff neck and shoulders that one gets with the, uh, with the cold or flu, then we'll often select gugentong. Another common formula is guichitong or cinnamon twig decoction. We use this one when there's a mild or slight sweating. Another one, this one's a mouthful, chuan xiong cha tiao san or ligastichum powder with green tea. This is what we use for the quote unquote head cold. So it could be a wind cold, it could be a wind heat, but if the main symptoms are pronounced stuffy or runny nose and a headache, especially a frontal headache or sinus headache, uh, this formula is fantastic for treating the headaches and, and relieving the, the sinusitis or rhinitis. Ma Huang Tong, ephedra decoction, we would use this if there is no sweating and we want to induce a little diaphoresis. Um, you may be familiar with the, with the phrase of, you know, did the fever break yet? And when the fever breaks, there's usually a little bit of sweating associated with that. So we use the mahuang tong to induce a little bit of a sweat to, to push out the pathogens through the pores. The trick now though is ephedra mahuang, it's currently banned by the FDA and so we as herbalists use a variety of substitute ingredients. So Ma Huang has multiple indications in Chinese medicine, but we're using it short term. It was banned by the FDA because it's dangerous to use with somebody that has hypertension. Uh, so long-term use of Ma Huang in someone with hypertension can put them at risk for cardiovascular disease. 
and, and Ma Huang got banned by the FDA because it was being abused by the diet pill industry. Uh, so Ma Huang, as ephedra, it can speed up metabolism, um, which is great for weight loss. However, we don't use it long-term in Chinese medicine, and they were using it very high dosages for very long periods of time, and people were dropping dead from heart attacks. Uh, so it, it was banned by the FDA uh, to include in any dietary supplements. Um, Ma Huang is also a very good bronchodilator. Um, so pseudoephedrine, um, similar compound, uh, you know, found in Sudafed. Um, uh, ephedrine compounds are also in albuterol inhalers. So Ma Huang, very effective for treating coughing and wheezing, asthma, those sorts of things. Um, so whether we want to use Ma Huang to expel a wind cold, whether we want to use Ma Huang for its respiratory effects, uh, Ma Huang is also a bit of a diuretic, so it can be used to treat edema. So depending on what action or indication we want from the Ma Huang, we have other ingredients that we could substitute for the Ma Huang to achieve uh, that similar effect. So though we can't use the true Ma Huang Tong in the United States anymore, we can get pretty close to it by making an effective substitution for the ephedra. And then another common formula, especially useful for kids, Rinchen Baidusan, a ginseng powder to overcome pathogenic influences. This is when we have a wind cold invasion with a background of a weak constitution or, or, or chi weakness in the patient. It was originally formulated as a pediatric formula, and I, I still use it quite a bit for kids. And it's also effective as um, a formula for the elderly. Uh, so if somebody is, is a little bit old and weak and they come down with a cold, uh, Rinch and Baidusan could be an effective choice for them. Switching over now to the wind heat, so higher fever, presence of sore throat, Yin Chao San, honeysuckle and forsythia powder. I find that this formula is most effective if we catch it in the first 24 to 72 hours of the onset, on the, upon the onset of symptoms. And we use it when sore throat is the prominent uh, symptom or complaint on the patient. Yin Chao San is both antiviral and antibacterial. And you may be familiar with the product Airborne. They sell it at CVS, Walgreens, Circle K, 7-Eleven. Airborne is basically the ingredients of Yin Chao San plus vitamin C, zinc, bubbling effervescence, and, and a little bit of flavor to go with it. Uh, so when you see Airborne and, and its effects for strengthening the immune system or treating colds and flus, just know that it's basically a, a reformulated version of yin chao san plus vitamin C, zinc, uh, and some flavor added to it. Songju yin, mulberry leaf and chrysanthemum decoction. It's similar to yin chao. We use it for milder presentations. So if we have a mild fever, we'll use the songju yin. And now instead of sore throat being the prominent symptom, cough is the chief symptom that's manifesting. So Songju Yin is going to be better at treating the cough. Yin Chao San is going to be better at treating the sore throat. And then we have our shotgun approach, Gan Mao Ling. Gan Mao Ling is now the most popular, best-selling patent medicine in China. It's best for wind heat presentations, but it can also be somewhat effective for wind cold. And because you can use it for a wind heat or a wind cold, you don't necessarily need to rely on a medical professional to make that determination. So a lot of people have it in their medicine chest at home. Gan Mao Ling has a strong antiviral effect, a stronger antiviral effect than Yin Chao San. Yin Chao San is gonna have more of an antibacterial effect than Gan Mao Ling, but 90% of our upper respiratory infections are viral. So Gan Mao Ling is gonna be pretty good for about 90% of those. Gan Ma Ling is also effective for later stages of cold and flu. 
So you'll notice up here that I say in chow is most effective in the first one to three days on the onset of symptoms. Many people aren't even going to see a doctor until after that fourth or fifth day when they're not getting better. So in chow, I don't have as much opportunity to prescribe to patients because by the time they come to see me in the clinic, that window of opportunity is, is already gone. But Gan Mao Ling, we have a longer window um, and we can use it to treat later stages of cold and flu. So you've been sick for four or five days, Gan Mao Ling will still have some effect for you. Now, COVID. COVID fits in this paradigm of wind cold, wind heat in its early stages. And our prevention of COVID is going to be the same strategy that we would use to strengthen our immune system and to prevent other forms <clears throat> of cold and flu. Um, COVID is a coronavirus. Coronaviruses have been around for a long time. And coronavirus, along with rhinovirus, uh, one of the most common viruses that cause the common cold. So our, our prevention of, of COVID would be similar or the same as our strategies to, to just regular cold and flu prevention. The difference between the COVID virus and the other coronaviruses and rhinoviruses is how quickly and rapidly it can progress and the constellation of other systemic problems that it causes. Um, you know, the, the massive inflammation with the cytokine storm, um, the cardiovascular problems, the kidney disease problems, um, all of those are, are unique to COVID uh, and not the other coronaviruses. And there are herbal treatments for various stages of infection with COVID. <clears throat> We talked a lot today about that prevention stage, just building up your Wei Qi and, and staying healthy. Early mild stage of COVID, this would be just starting to show symptoms. Uh, there are a variety of treatments for that. Um, you know, we have dozens and dozens of formulas here uh, that, that we've been able to, to see with what they've been using in China for early stage. When it gets to the moderate or severe stage, there are still effective remedies, but this is probably when folks are gonna be being started to admitted to the ICU and the hospitals. Um, in China, they'll administer herbs via IV, uh, but in most hospitals here in the United States, um, you're not gonna be able to, to take herbs once you've been admitted to the ICU. Uh, there were a couple of hospitals in Los Angeles, uh, when I had patients admitted that I was able to, to get Chinese herbs dispensed through the hospital pharmacy, uh, but it did involve uh, a long conversation with both the, uh, the attending physician uh, and the pharmacist on staff. Um, I doubt that that would be available to, uh, to any patients in, in Tucson hospitals. And then <clears throat> as we've heard, the recovery stage from COVID can last quite a while. So discharge from the hospital, no longer testing positive, so no longer shedding active virus, but taking a long time to recover, a long time to re recoup that lung function, a long time to get your energy back. Um, you know, people feeling run down for, for several months after their COVID illness. So we have quite a few different herbs and formula strategies uh, to help assist in this recovery stage uh, so that the patient can get back on, back on their feet more quickly. And in China, more than 85% of all the patients with coronavirus received herbal treatment along with Western medicine treatments. And then countless more use herbal medicine as a preventative measure to strengthen their immune systems. And that 85% um, data point there comes from the Ministry of Science and Technology in China. Uh, they were almost requiring patients to take both herbal medicine and Western medicine. Um, and just for the record, the, uh, you may not be able to trust the, the numbers out of China 100%, but their mortality rate was about 1 20th of what it is here in the United States. This is a formula that we've been brewing on campus here since the beginning of COVID. 
we're calling it the ASOM Respiratory Health Formula. It's been adapted from a formula that they were using at the Hubei Provincial Hospital of TCM in Hubei Province in China. And you can see here the top three herbs are the Wuping Feng San, the Astralagus, Attractolotus, and Siler Feng Feng. And then added to that are herbs that have specific inclusions and strategies. So the Guanzhong is very good for treating infections in the lungs. Um, it's, it's good for bronchodilation, uh, helps to transform and expel phlegm. Lonacera Jinyan Hua, this is a strong antiviral herb. Chen Pi, this is a tangerine peel. It's very good at transforming phlegm and uh, moving qi in the chest. Po Xiang uh, is included in here to treat some of the potential gastrointestinal symptoms of, of COVID. And then Jigong platicati, uh, it's another bronchodilating herb, uh, very good for aiding respiratory health and lung qi. So we would take this as a preventative formula and then we could modify it slightly if there was a case confirmed diagnosis of COVID, we would probably take out these first two ingredients here. We would take out the chi tonics and then we would add in more antiviral um, and, and, and um, bronchodilating herbs. Uh, if there were manifestations of the cytokine storm, adding in anti-inflammatory herbs, uh, if there were issues of the blood clotting and bleeding, we would be using herbs that help to improve circulation. Um, so they're all chosen based on specific signs and symptoms, um, not only what the patient is reporting to us, but what we would see in their tongue and pulse as well. Those are two pillars of, uh, of Chinese diagnosis. Now, as far as the acupuncture goes, all of these things here have been confirmed in peer-reviewed mainstream medical journals. So there have been studies that show that acupuncture improves our energy, improves range of motion in the musculoskeletal system, it improves circulation, it helps to boost our immune function, it helps to regulate hormones, it helps us to sleep, and it helps us to relax or relieve stress. And then acupuncture also helps to reduce pain, reduce inflammation, reduce stress, reduce fatigue, reduce anxiety. So as a general medical modality and in health intervention, if we can improve everything here on the left and reduce everything here on the right, that's pretty much a recipe for optimal health. And we would be choosing specific acupuncture points for whatever the clinical manifestation is uh, that the patient presents with and using different meridians and different points, we can manipulate the chi uh, in almost infinite ways um, to, to help restore balance and restore health to the patient. And then this last slide here is a list of conditions that are commonly treated with Chinese medicine. Uh, this list comes from the World Health Organization of all of the different types of pain and illness that there is um, peer-reviewed published research uh, for the use of acupuncture showing, showing efficacy. So we can treat musculoskeletal issues, neck pain, back pain, pain in the extremities, sprains, strains, arthritis, tendinitis, fibromyalgia, TMJ, can treat a variety of digestive issues, constipation, diarrhea, IBS, indigestion, IBS, uh, colitis, heartburn, can treat cardiovascular disease, hypertension, chest pain, high cholesterol, palpitations, arrhythmias. It can help with detox, uh, detoxifying the body from nicotine, prescription and illicit drugs, and alcohol. It can treat a variety of skin conditions, uh, psoriasis, acne, eczema, rashes, can treat in the psycho-emotional realm, stress, insomnia, anxiety, depression, mania, fatigue, irritability, 
post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders. It has neurological benefits to treat headaches, migraines, seizures, dizziness, neuropathy, sciatica, Bell's palsy, can treat respiratory issues. Uh, you know, the focus of today, common cold and flu, but also asthma, allergies, bronchitis, sinusitis, sore throat, cough, can treat gynecological issues, menstrual pain, PMS, regular periods, infertility, endometriosis, and help to relieve menopause symptoms. And it can be used to treat your urological conditions, uh, UTIs, difficult urination, sexual dysfunction, et cetera. So that is my last slide of the presentation. I'm gonna exit the screen share here. I'm gonna go ahead and upload that now into the files in our chat. So give me a moment to browse for that. All right, it's uploaded in there now. And happy to take any questions from the group. Any questions on diet, exercise, herbs, specific strategies for specific diagnoses? Frank has a question about fasting for weight loss. So I have mixed thoughts on fasting. Um, my preference would be intermittent fasting. So fasting, um, you know, from let's call it 5 p.m. in the afternoon up until breakfast time, or eating a little bit of a later dinner and then skipping breakfast. Uh, the key with the intermittent fasting is going approximately 16 hours without food, um, which helps to prime <clears throat> our body to start burning fat for fuel. But it's important that we not break that fast. So even having a cup of coffee with some cream in it in the morning is going to break that fast. So oftentimes people will use, uh, if you've heard of bulletproof coffee, um, using coconut oil and butter instead of the, instead of the dairy creamer, um, that doesn't necessarily break the, the, the fast in the morning. Um, and the, the coconut oil or any medium chain fatty acid oil uh, along with the butter, it gives you a little bit of energy. It gives a, it, it, the brain, kind of runs on fat. So the, the fat from the unsalted butter uh, is gonna help your brain be awake during the day, um, even though you're not necessarily having breakfast. Um, if, if you want to do a fast, a longer fast, a couple of times a year, change of the seasons, I don't really recommend doing it more than three or four times a year. Those are typically more effective for cleansing the body of toxins than they are as a long-term weight loss strategy. Because typically when you break the fast, if you're doing like a four or five, six day fast, um, the body puts the weight on very quickly again. Um, the, with, with longer fasting, the body sort of goes into this mode of, well, you know, it, it does the detox, but then it's worried that the famine is coming. So then it starts storing things as fat again for the next time the famine comes around, i.e. the next time you go on a fast. So the, the results with longer fasts tend to be temporary. I find that the intermittent fasting is a little bit of a better strategy uh, for, for long-term weight loss. 
intermittent fasting isn't necessarily going to do so much though for for you as a as a detox strategy. So if you want to try and purge a bunch of toxins from your body, intermittent fasting won't do so much. Uh, what the intermittent fasting does is after about 12 hours or so, when there's no more glucose circulating in the bloodstream, uh, it then starts to draw upon the 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 fat stores as a as an energy source. Does that answer your question, Frank? All right, any other questions from the group? Ah, Taylor is asking my preferred way to take formulas, powder, dried herb, tinctured, or... So we have to balance optimal preparation and absorption with the convenience that the patient requires. So. Preferred way is to take the raw herbs and, and cook them yourself at home. Um, you know, adding in six cups of water, boiling them or simmering them for 45 minutes to an hour or, or whatever the in cooking instructions are for the specific herb because different herbs require different cooking instructions. You reduce it down to one or, one or two cups and then drink that. That's called a, a decoction method. Uh, it's essentially a, an aqueous extraction of the active ingredients. It's the traditional way of preparing the herbs. It's one of the best ways as far as absorption goes into the body, um, but it's not very convenient. It's time consuming. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, uh, i.e. cooking a particular herb at too high a temperature, too low a temperature, too long of a time, not long enough of a time. So the next best from that would be, oh, and there's also the, uh, let's just call it the very strong flavor associated with decocted herbs. So the next best after that would be powdered extracts. So the powders, you mix them up with hot water. You don't have to cook them for a long time. Just give it a good stir uh, and then drink it down. So much more convenient than cooking the herbs yourself. There's a small drop off in efficacy uh, and bioavailability, but not bad. Um, you can be assured that the ingredients have all been cooked uh, properly, um, but there's still the flavor component, which there's just a few folks can't get around that. So then, you know, the most convenient would be tablets or pills. Um, you're not going to digest them quite as well. There's not going to be quite as strong. Uh, I find that the packaging dosage indications are indicating far less than than you would get if you were decocking the herbs yourself. Um, they tend to be a little more expensive because there's more preparation involved, but there is the convenience. You know, you can throw the, the bottle of pills in your purse or your backpack uh, and take them with you, and you don't have to worry about having access to hot water to mix up the tea um, so I find that most of my patients are opting for the loose powder that they mix with the tea. A few will do the, the capsules or tablets uh, based on the convenience um, or intolerance to the flavor of drinking the beverage. Um, and then some do really prefer the, the traditional method uh, and I'll make sure that they understand uh, how to cook them, but it's usually students that are that are more interested in, in learning how to cook the herbs that in the traditional format rather than patients. Yeah, so I, I, I try to just educate my patients on the upside and downside of all of it. Uh, and then let them make the choice as far as what they think they're going to be most adherent to. Because I could write the most elegant custom formula and assemble the, the roots and the twigs and the leaves and the flowers, but if it never gets prepared, it doesn't do any good. Um, and, you know, if they take the pills and they're adherent to the dosage on the pills, but not willing to drink the tea, um, I'll, I'll go with whatever they're willing to do.
Any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, that concludes my presentation for today. I will go ahead and stick around on the camera for a few extra minutes um, in case there's any other questions uh, that folks want to bring up. So I will go ahead and, and stay on here until everybody has logged off. <laughs>